Hi, I'm Crazy Listeners. This is Shivani from India. So I am not a poet, neither I am someone who has perfect uh, enunciation and pronunciation skills. I'm just a girl who likes to read books and more than that, like read them out loud. It just uh, makes me feel so happy and so in the moment. So I just read them out loud. And so this is, I'm just recording this uh, one book that I'm currently reading by John Keats. It's a collectible edition. It entangles 100 selected poems by Keats. And for no apparent reason, I will be recording it. So you guys can listen to it if you like listening to poems. And let me know if you like it so that maybe I can take it more seriously and record. But as of now, this is um, as raw as it can get. And this is like my first time reading it out loud. This piece and as well as this thing that I'm doing right now. So <clears throat> here goes nothing. So I'll be reading it cover to cover. And in the very first page, you can see a letter that has been written by John Keats to John Taylor, February 27th, 1818. So Keats is saying, in poetry, I have to wait see. And you will see how far I am from this end. First, I think poetry should surprise by a fine excess and not by singularity. It should strike the reader as the wording of his own highest thoughts and appear almost a remembrance. Second, its touches of beauty should never be half quick, thereby making the readers breathless instead of content. But it is easier to think what poetry should be than to write it. And this leads me to another example, that if poetry comes not as naturally as the leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all. So beautiful. So after that, there is some information about Keats, about his early life and his poems. Born on October 31, 1795, in Moore Day, London, John Keats was one of the most eminent poets of the Romantic Revival in the early 19th century. He was the last person to be born among the Romantics in the first time. The eldest son of Francis Jennings and Thomas Keats, a stable keeper, he had three siblings, George, Tom, and Francis Mary, who were very close to him. As a child, Keats attended from the local Jane schools, and in August 1803, he was sent to be educated at Rev. John Clark's school in Enfield. George accompanied him, and Tom also joined the same school later. During his years there, he befriended Charles Calvin Clark, the headmaster's son, who mentored Keats and introduced him to the literature of the Renaissance. Keats read the works of Chapman, Spencer, and Tassel. <clears throat> he developed an inclination towards history and classes and soon became a voracious reader. Keith was eight when he lost his father in 1804. Thomas had fallen from a horse and he did not survive the skull fracture. Within a couple of months, his mother remarried, but she broke up with her new husband soon. The Keith's children were then moved to live with the maternal planter in the 19th. After their grandfather's death, the following year, the family shifted to Edmonton. Francis Jennings died from tuberculosis in March 1810. After her death, Keith's grandmother appointed John Sandal and Richard Abbey as the children's guardians. In the same summer, Keith left school and joined Thomas Hammond, a surgeon, as an apprentice. During his spare hours there, he devoured books and initiated writing courses. Inspired and fascinated by the fairy land, Spencer's The Fairy Queen, Keats wrote his first poem, Imitation of Spencer, in early 1840. In the spring of the same year, he penned down on peace 
an irregular Shakespearean sonnet celebrating peace and Paris. He read the works of fellow poets, including Lee Hunt, who was the co-founder of the radical weekly journal called The Examiner and Lord Byron. Fill for me a brimming bowl and to Lord Byron were written later the same year. Okay, it says, fill for me a brimming bowl. Anyway, he wrote, as, as from the darkening gloom on a silver dove, and can death be seen when life is but a dream in December 1840. It is believed that they were written after his grandmother's death. Keats was extremely fond of her. After completing his apprenticeship, Keats left for London, where he joined the Guy's Hospital as a medical student in October 1850. He was soon appointed at the hospital as a dresser or a junior house surgeon. His workload and responsibilities increased, and it appeared that he was serious about his medical career. Oh, solitude, if I must with thee dwell, a poem composed in the late 1815, was his first published poem. It appeared in the May 5, 5th, 1816, issue of The Examiner. The same summer, he began working on Kelly Dore and wrote an epistle to his friend George Felton Matthew. This was the beginning of his letter writing era. In July 1816, Keats cleared the examination at Apoth Apothecary's Hall and was granted the apothecary's license. Though he could not practice as an apothecary, surgeon, and physician, Keats continued to devote more and more time to writing verses. In October, he met Lee Hunt, Benjamin Hayden, and John Hamilton Reynolds. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, was written among, around the same time. A Petrarchan sonnet, it captures Keats' awe at works of Homer, translated by the classical scholar George Chapman. A classic poem, it is often quoted and is considered a beautiful work of art where imagination is employed at its best. It was first published in the Examiner in December. By the end of 1816, Keats was determined to follow his ambition and, became, and become a poet instead of a surgeon. This was much to the disappointment of one of his guardians, Abbey. Keats visited the British Museum with Hayden in March 1817 and saw the Elgin Marbles. Soon afterwards, he wrote the sonnet on seeing the Elgin Marbles. During the same time, his first volume of poetry was published by Charles and James Ollier. The collection included his poems, Sleep and Poetry. I stood tiptoe upon a little hill. His epistles to George Felton Matthew, his brother George and Clark and his sonnets. Mostly written in heroic verse, the poems in his volume reveal his aesthetic love for nature and the epistles reflect his liking for literature. Poems, 1817, wasn't a success. The publishers were embarrassed of it. Keats contacted Taylor and Hesse to publish his future books. Through them, he came across Richard Woodhouse, the lawyer, who highly appreciated his collection. The two befriended each other, and Woodhouse began collecting Keats' verses. In spring 1817, Keats traveled to Isle of Wight, where he started working on Endymion. Based on the Greek legend of Endymion, the shepherd beloved of the moon, goddess Selene, the original story is elaborated in his poem. After his return to London, he moved to Margate with his fathers. Tom was suffering from tuberculosis, and both Keats and George took care of him. Endymion was completed in November 1817. His first long poem was divided into four books of around 1,000 lines each and was written in heroic couplets. It was published as a volume after considerable revisions by Taylor and Hesse in May 1818. The poem was severely criticized by the readers. Later, in 1817, Keats met many renowned contemporary writers, including Charles Lamb and William Wordsworth, and began the following year by attending William Hazlitt's lectures. By the end of spring 1818, he had completed Isabel, or a pot of basil, an adaptation of the fifth story told on the fourth day in Boccaccio's Decameron, the narrative poem is an exploration of passionate romances. The Blackwoods magazine published a scathing criticism of his poems, 1817. So this is this um, criticism, right? The Frenzy of the Poems, 1817, 
was bad in a friend's way. But it did not alarm us half. So seriously is the calm, settled, imperturbable, dribbling idiocracy of Endymion. The quarterly review ran him down further and denounced the Endymion. We confess that we have not read his work Endymion. Not that we have been wanting in our duty. Far from it indeed. We have made efforts almost as superhuman as the story itself appears to be to get through it. But with the fullness stretch of our perseverance, we are forced to confess that we have not been able to struggle beyond the first of the four books. This author is a, co- is a copyist of Mr. Hunt, but he is more unintelligible, almost as rugged, twice as diffuse, and ten times more tiresome and absurd than his prototype. He cannot indeed write a sentence, but perhaps he may be able to spin a line. But none of this deterred Keats's passion for writing poetry. In, on August 2, 1818, Keats climbed Ben Nevis with Brown, highest mountain in British Isles, and wrote the sonnet, Read me and listen, muse, and speak it out loud. Keats began working on Hyperion in autumn, while nursing Tom through his illness. When in December Tom passed away, Keats shifted to Wentworth Place. Charles Brown's house in Hampstead. He met Fanny Brown, who was his neighbor, and fell in love with her completely. They saw each other every day and often read together. Brown became Keith's muse, and he produced some of his finest and mature verses in the following year. The Eve of St. Fredness, The Eve of St. Mark, La Belle Dame Saint Mercy, La Mia, and his famous odes were written in 1890. Composed in 42 Spenserian stanzas, The Eve of St. Agnes, a romantic narrative poem, is considered one of the most significant poems in the literature of the 19th century. The Eve of St. Mark was left unfinished and published posthumously in 1848. A class apart, the odes of Keats had little to do with the odes of the past. Five of these immortal odes were composed in the spring of 1890. Intense and passionately human. Ode to Manitum, who the finest among all is a concerted composition. An ode on a Grecian urn, the permanence of art is contrasted with the impermanence and ethics of human life. An ode on melancholy, Keats plunges into the recesses from where emotion derives. He discovers the souls of melancholy and beauty and explains that only those will know what real melancholy is who have experienced utmost joy. Ode to Psyche was inspired by the Cupid and Psyche myth in Greek mythology. <coughs> Ode on indolence has for its own themes lethargy and languor. Begun in June and completed around September, Lamia tells the story of a beautiful enchantress. It is based on Burton's The Anatomy of Melancholy. Rich in imagery, the poem has never ceased to capture the attention of its readers. Keats collaborated with Charles Brown and wrote a play called Otho the Great, A Tragedy in Five Acts. In Ode to Autumn, written in September 1819, Keats personifies autumn with vivid imagery and unparalleled descriptions. The ode has been considered one of the most exemplary short poems in English language. Having an abandoned Hyperion in, 18, in April 1819, Keats revisited it in September and began reconstructing and expanding the earlier epic. The fall of Hyperion, a dream, was influenced by the earlier epics, namely Paradise Lost, Divine Comedy, and A Need. This too was abandoned by Keats sometime in September. Keats was engaged to Braun the following month, though the love remained unconsummated. Keats wrote a number of letters and notes to her and also gave her the poem, White Star. The next year only brought ill health to the poet. He suffered from tuberculosis, and Keats and Ron could not meet as often as the desire. He wrote to her in a letter dated March 1820. Sweetest one, you fear sometimes I do not love you so as much as you wish. My dear girl, I love you ever and ever and without reserve. The more I have known you, the more have I loved. 
in every way even my jealousies have been agonies of love in the forest that i've ever had i would have died for you i have vexed you too much but for love can i help it you are always me so good <coughs> His next volume of poems, Lamia, Isabella, The Eve of St. Agnes, and other poems, was published by Taylor and Hesse in July 1820. It received a favorable response with positive reviews in the Examiner and Edinburgh Review. As Keith's health deteriorated, he was advised to shift to a place with warmer climate. He left on a voyage for Rome where he failed to recover. Keats breathed his last on February 23rd, 1821, aged 25. His tombstone bears the following epitaph. This grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who was on his deathbed. In the bitterness of his heart at the malicious power of his enemies, he sired these words to be engraven on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. From his early poems, which were considered to be written under the influence of his close friend and contemporary, it was mature and flawless poetry written in the latter years, Keats came a long way in a very short time, and a lifespan lasting only two decades and a half, and a poetic career lasting only a few years, he penched down some of the most exquisite verses, with beautifully crafted phrases, colored by his vivid imagination and sharp intellect, he created faultless verses in the simplest of language, a master personification and concrete imagery. The magnificence of Keats' style is evident in his poems. Just like his verses, his letters also reveal how insightful and passionate he was. His works continue to remain among the greatest and most beautiful creations in English language. Now, after that, there are there's an index, and we have first poem, which I will be reading in the next audio. <clears throat> 